Okay, so this is my second vlog for English 153. Um, we read chapters 1 through 8 in Jan Morris's Conundrum. And um, for this vlog, I really want to focus on the language that Morris was using and her diction and how she wrote certain things and um, how they kind of tie into like a bigger meaning with the story. Um, me personally, I'm a very literal person. So a lot of times when we like read, um, when I read literature and there's fancy language and just like trying to analyze everything, I struggle with finding the deeper meanings of things. And so um, when that happens, which this is not necessarily that case, but just in general, when that happens, I really like to look at the language, and um, so that's what I'm going to do for this vlog. So to begin, I was really looking at um, the vocab that Morris was using and um, how scholarly it was. It was very, there's a lot of big words that I did not know that I had to look up, and um, a lot of times she used very flowery language, and um kind of like added a lot of sensory details that weren't necessarily um, needed. Like it made the story more interesting for sure. And, um, but I feel like the way that she said certain things could have been said more straightforward in a different way. So um, that's why I was really focusing on that while reading. And um, the first word that I looked up actually was conundrum. And um, I've heard of it. I basically knew what it meant, but I wanted like a textbook definition. And it's a confusing and difficult problem or question. So this made me wonder about um, what this book is going to be about, because that's the title of the book also, obviously. And um, so it kind of makes me think like, oh, like, is she questioning herself? Is she questioning the world? Who is she questioning? So there was this quote on page 12 in the second paragraph, and it goes, I came to it an anomaly, a contradiction in myself, and were it not for the flexibility and self-amusement I absorbed from the Oxford culture, which is to say the culture of traditional England, I think I would long ago have ended in that last haven of anomaly, the madhouse. So, um... First of all, uh, for this may be kind of weird, but I love the word anomaly, and um, I think that um, the word itself is actually an anomaly. I um, this maybe kind of had like a personal connection because in high school I was in a photography class and I did a portfolio on um, an anomaly, and um, so I really got to like know that word. So now every time I say that word, I'm like, oh my god, like. Um, which is not relevant at all but so when she said that I was like this makes a lot of like I knew exactly what she was talking about what she was referring to and um, and then also the word madhouse in that sentence really caught my eye and um, it makes me kind of like the two the word anomaly and madhouse kind of connect together some way in my head because um, it gives like a really good image of what she is saying. And I think that's really important. Another thing that I wanted to talk about was Morris's use of italics. On page seven, she writes their lives, the word their being in italics. And on page 21, she writes, and that every boy wished to become a girl, every being in italics. And I think that she uses this as a way to kind of give herself a voice and like adding an accent kind of like their uh, their lives and every boy and um I I really like that and when I read that at first I kind of glossed over it like just thinking why was that in italics it must be important so I reread it and um said it out loud to myself and was like oh like it seems accident. It, it was there purposely. And um, I think that's what she was trying to do. And um, 
that definitely made a difference while reading and uh, it made me pay attention more.